compliqué. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Quarantine Book Talks. I'm Judith Rosenbaum of the Jewish Women's Archive. I'm so excited to be back here with you tonight. If you are new to JWA and to our Quarantine Book Talks, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to be back this fall. If you've been with us for months or have participated in our most recent online history course, welcome back. So glad to have you here. I'm really excited for our upcoming QBT sessions uh, with great thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities for supporting our online programming and to Jewish Live for being a great partner for us since the beginning of QBT back in March. Uh, for those of you who don't know, JWA is a digital archive that helps to expand the Jewish narrative by documenting and sharing Jewish women's stories. We provide a wide range of role models and we draw on the richness of our history for insight about the world today. And I hope that you will check out jwa.org to see the wonderful rich resources that we have available there. This is just one little tiny taste of what we have to offer. At a moment of logistics before I introduce our author for tonight, please continue to introduce yourselves uh, in the chat box and ask questions in the chat box and I will share them uh, in the discussion. Um, and when you're chatting, make sure to chat to panelists and attendees <coughs> so that we can all see what you are saying. I am delighted to introduce Esther Amini, our featured author tonight. Esther is a writer, painter, and a psychoanalytic psychotherapist in private practice in New York. Her short stories have appeared in many publications, including Elle, Lilith, Tablet, The Jewish Week, Barnard Magazine, and many others. She was named one of Aspen World's two best emerging memoir memoirists and awarded its Emerging Writer Fellowship in 2016 based on her memoir, which we'll be discussing tonight. In 2019, she was the artist in residence at the Jewish Women's Theater, which has also performed her pieces and has also been a wonderful partner to JWA. And Concealed is Esther's debut memoir. Welcome, Esther. We're really delighted to have you with us. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. So it was, I really enjoyed reading your book um, and I learned so much from your book about the world that your family comes from. You have a very unusual family background. Test, can you start by telling us a little bit about, um, about your family heritage? Sure. Uh, my parents came from the Iranian city of Mashhad. Uh, Mashhad in Iran is the most fanatical a fanatically religious city in all of Iran. Um, and so the Jews in Mashhad for hundreds and hundreds of years have lived underground, pretending that they're Muslim, uh, above ground, uh, well, above ground, they pretended they were Muslim and uh, in the privacy of their homes, they were devout Jews. So very often they're compared to the Muranos of Spain. Uh, they were crypto Jews. Uh, so that's the background of my parents. Right after World War II, they came to the United States. They came to New York with my two brothers. And a few years later, I was born here in New York. Uh, the book is a memoir. It's entitled Concealed. And it is about being caught at the, caught at the intersection of medieval Mashhad and 20th century America, you know? And I'm born at that intersection. Uh, my parents brought much of the values, customs, mores of Mashhad. I always have to be very specific, not just say Iran because the city of Meshed is distinctly different from the other cities. Um, and so finding my way through, navigating, wanting to honor my parents, and at the same time, honor my own aspirations uh, was a challenge. It was very difficult in some ways and very um, rewarding in other ways. 
but the book is not a history book. It, I have to give the background of the Mashadi Jews so that you understand the psychology, uh, the thinking of my parents. But it really is about being a little girl, an adolescent, a young adult, finding her way and trying to balance the two, um, having my parents and having me too. Uh, and there's a lot of humor in the book. There are a lot of funny episodes, misunderstandings, culture clashes, you know, Iran and America are diametrically opposite. Very often they don't understand each other. Uh, my parents were diametric opposites who did not understand each other, which lends itself to many comedic moments. Uh, so that's in there as well. Would you be willing to sh share a little bit from the book so we can get a taste of what it meant to live uh, at that intersection of, of different cultures and different um, values? Meaning you'd like me to read yeah. something? Okay. Um, I figure I'll start from the beginning and I'll read the prologue, which is very short. The prologue is called Invisible. <clears throat> Esther is not here. Gwendolyn, my third grade classmate, had come over to play. As soon as she walked through our front door, dressed in pink and blue argyle socks and a matching cardigan, my father gave her a stabbing stare. Esther is not here, he said icily. I was standing right there, right next to him, in plain view. Gwen's eyes met mine. I quickly looked away and tried to hide in the spaces between his words. With a ferocious wave, Pop sent her away and swept back into the living room without a glance in my direction. I was invisible to him. I looked at my feet, touched my elbows, then began shaking like a rag doll. My mind gunked up. Could he be right? Am I imagining me? The shame was immense, a heart punch. Would Gwen tell my entire class what had just happened? Would she say Esther's father is Iranian and that's what they do? It wasn't the first time Pop had insisted I wasn't visible when I was, but I was no less mortified. How could I be unseen when seen? How could I disappear upon demand? I didn't call out, I am here. I was afraid of words. Pop often cautioned, speech makes lips unclean. So at age eight, fearing his angry outbursts and wanting clean lips, I chose silence. I wished my mother were home. She, born with sword in hand, would never have let this happen. She would have shoved Pop aside, invited Gwen in, and offered her trays of popping, piping hot, homemade Persian pastries. Gwen would have loved my mother and been fooled into thinking my home was much like hers. She'd never know what I knew. By third grade, I was practicing shrinking, abiding by Pop's rules to avoid his wrath. I ate little, spoke minimally, breathed soundlessly, while my mother worked at becoming ever more visible, expanding to the point of bursting, no matter the consequence. I was a consequence. Thank you. I think that gives us a taste of many of the uh, dramatic tensions that are in the book. Um, but you know, you describe yourself as someone who's afraid of words. So how does someone who begins as a little girl who's afraid of words come to write a memoir? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, for many years as a child, I was quiet, rather withdrawn, had trouble expressing myself. And uh, I then threw myself into painting from a young age and did a lot of painting and felt I was expressing myself non-verbally. And for many years, I told myself I can read and I can appreciate literature, but I can't write. And uh, over the past five years, I worked on this book and I proved myself wrong. 
So I guess it was an evolution. And what did it mean to you to write this, especially as somebody who comes from a community where women were traditionally illiterate and where education for women was not valued or encouraged? So for you to become somebody who would be not only a reader, but a writer, I imagine feels like a very big step. It's a very big step forward. Uh, the women in my family were illiterate uh, and for example, my grandmother was nine years old when she was forced to marry my grandfather, who was 29. Uh, my mother was 14 when she was forced to marry my father, who was 34. Girls were kept illiterate out of school. My mother never attended kindergarten, first grade, any, any form of education. Um, and the prevailing wisdom at the time was that an illiterate girl will turn into an excellent wife. She will not have a voice. She won't have opinions. She won't be controversial. She won't be oppositional. Um, it's not really true because my mother had quite a voice and was uh, irreverent in many ways and illiterate at the same time. But that was the prevailing wisdom. So that's my background. And I'm the first female, again in my family, the first female to not only attend elementary school, high school, college, graduate school, um, have a profession, but now write a book. And uh, I felt I had to do it. I felt all the women who came before me couldn't, even if they wanted to, they couldn't. I felt an obligation to give voice to them, to their stories. They were heroic in many ways, unsung heroes and heroines. Um, and I felt I had to also be that link between the past, which was my parents' generation, uh, crypto Jews, and the future those who would otherwise not know about the Mashadi Jews. Um, I heard so many stories firsthand from my mother and she was a big talker. She enjoyed sharing her life. Uh, I heard a lot from relatives. Uh, my brothers remembered their past in Iran. And I did a lot of research in addition. Um, so I really felt it was up to me to weave the Meshadi Jews into the tapestry of the Jewish story. They've been left out. And a lot of it has to do with us. We haven't written our story. We haven't talked about it. Uh, we haven't shared it with the world. Um, and I think they, it's really vital that they also be threaded in. And I have this question and a number of people have just asked this in the chat as well. What has the reaction of your family and community been to, to putting this story down on paper and, and in, you know, putting it out into the public? To my surprise, because I had no idea how everyone would respond, um, they embraced the book. I've received many phone calls, many emails, congratulating me, thanking me. Um, feeling that I did what they wish they could have done, um, applauding me for my bravery because I'm very open and honest and candid in the book. Um, so it's been warmly received and uh, that's been fantastic. That's wonderful. Um, we have some questions about the nature of the Mashadi Jewish community. Can you tell us about how large the community was and whether there are any remnants of the community uh, in Mashad today? I don't know of any uh, Mashadi Jews in Mashad. That doesn't mean that they're not there. Uh, so I'm not an authority on that, but I personally don't know. Like my family left my family, my relatives left right after World War II, way before the Khomeini Revolution. And then of course, during the Khomeini Revolution, many left. Um, it's hard to know how many 
were living in Mashhad during my parents' generation. Uh, this is the mid 20th century. And that's amazing in itself that this crypto Judaism was going on mid 20th century. We're not talking thousands of years ago. Um, but I would guess a few hundred families uh, and they were tight knit, tightly knit. They lived in a ghetto um, and they looked out for one another. And I know that you lived in a, a there were there were other Mashadi Jews who joined you in the uh, community that you lived with in Queens. Were there other kind of outposts and other places where there were gatherings of Mashadi Jews who moved together or found each other? Yes. Well, when my parents moved to Kew Gardens, Queens, uh, uh, there were roughly six families from Meshad and they decided to live together in Kew Gardens, just a few houses apart uh, and be a support system to one another. So originally there were only six families. Yes, there are, there's a Mashadi community in London rather large, Mashadi community in Milan, Italy, in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, in New York, uh, in Great Neck, um, in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, and they tend to marry from within. They tend to marry one another uh, and stay very insulated, which has a lot to do with their history and the way they were persecuted and tortured and tormented and um, and had to distrust the outside world. And the only way that they felt there'd be continuity of Judaism was if they married from within. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, are, are these communities all connected with one another, you know, digitally? Well, they all, the families know one another. This goes back, right. you know, hundreds of years. So the families know one another, people travel, they go to London and they check out their relatives and meet the others. And um, so digitally, I'm sure they do it that way as well, but they're familiar with one another. The connections were already tight even before the internet yes. made such things yes. possible. Yes. So one of the things that I found really interesting in your book is you write about how um, you felt like your family had a kind of tendency towards duplicity, which you saw as really stemming from their experience as crypto Jews and having to, you know, being used to hiding who they really were and kind of living this, as you say, sort of above ground existence and underground existence. Tell us a little bit about how you saw that manifesting in your family life. Well, it was really my mother who was adept at um, presenting a self that wasn't her. Uh, and there are many humorous stories in the book one is when she had a passion for clothing and she loved Oscar de la Renta and she decided she's going to, she's going to own his gowns. So she uh, grabbed me. I was a teenager, forced me to come along and she went to the Oscar de la Renta showroom in Manhattan and pretended that she owned a boutique in Tehran. She called it uh, Tehran 2000 tried to give it kind of an advanced name. Uh, this, is, this was in the 1950s uh, and told them that she has to buy very certain sizes because the women in Tehran don't like to wear the same dress. And she picked out my size, her size, my sister's-in-law's sizes and just bought and kept coming every year, stocking her closet with Oscar de la Renta. And she had such a way of doing it. I was appalled and in awe. I was ashamed and I was proud. Uh, it was something I thought I could never do. And it was, you know, it was, it was being a con artist and she was very skilled at it. Uh, but I do think it stems from living that duplicitous life in Mashhad and having to get by uh, through deceit. Right, I thought you did such a good job of showing how um, 
these kinds of really, these experiences of hardship could create skills that were great survival skills and also skills that could be completely crazy making yes. <laughs> in the people that you have to live with. Yes, yes, very true. Um, one of the other things that you write about is the power of the, the concept of family honor, which mm. a, a beru, is that? A beru, a beru. Yes. Um, so can you tell us a little bit, describe the role that that played in your family and, and um, how that kind of played out and then also what your relationship is to that notion now? Oh, that's a good question. A bru is such a powerful artery that runs through the Iranian culture. And I feel it to this day. I mean, I will always feel it. Uh, a bru means one's face one's reputation um, and the families have families have a reputation for generations there are families that have upheld uh, the the image of integrity honesty uh, kindness generosity uh, the, this is very important and if you behave that way you pass that reputation onto your children before they even begin to show who they are. They inherit uh, those traits. Uh, if you blemish your abru, those your children inherit that as well. And people don't want to marry your children when they grow up because they don't don't come from a family with a brew with a good reputation a good face a good image um, and so much of what you say and do falls under the category of a brew whether it it's in sync with developing the family of brew or whether it'll damage the family of brew this is so foreign to americans this is the last thing they would ever be thinking about and yet this is a core value system uh, within the Iranian world. Um, and so if I wore a short skirt, this is the 1960s, I'm a teenager. My father would be horrified and tell me that I was destroying our family of Bru, uh, that if people saw me on the street that way, and of course it would be if the Mashadi Jews saw me on the street that way in Queens, um, it would dishonor him and dishonor all of us. So it's not, oh, this just reflects on you, Esther. This reflects on the entire family. Um, if I spoke up, I was a quiet child and I was very careful with how I spoke. But if I defied him, even respectfully, if I disagreed, publicly in front of others, which I rarely did, uh, he would feel that I was damaging the family of Ru, which would carry on for generations. Uh, so it really, it has a stronghold on you. In, the one, in one way, it's choking you because you can't be free to say what you're thinking or feeling. On the other hand, it regulates good behavior and you have that in the forefront of your mind all the time that you want to, you want your family to be proud of you. You want to be proud of yourself. Watch your words. Think about how you behave all the time. Um, so it has a stronghold on you. And in the book, it comes up a lot and it's the way I navigate my way around that Aubru, which at times I detested that whole theme. And at times I embraced it, feeling it has tremendous value. And you obviously can take pride in your family and your family's accomplishments, but it also put limitations, particularly as a girl in what you could pursue because having independence or education presumably would also reflect poorly on your family if that wasn't the norm. Right. Well, I had to hide the fact that I wanted not only to read and write, but 
that I wanted in education. And um, that, that was a problem. I used to read books under, under the sheets in bed with a flashlight. And if my father walked in, I'd have to hide everything really quickly and pretend I was asleep. Uh, I used to forge my father's signature on report cards, not because I did poorly, but because I was doing very well. And he would be outraged if he found out. Um, he, we lived in America, and so he believed that the children had to go to school, that it was a law. So if he could have prevented that, if he could have kept me at home and not sent me to elementary school, he would have been thrilled. But knowing it was a law, he had to cave and give in to that. Uh, but no way did he want me to go on to college. And I did, I did want to go on. So I was forging his signature left and right and applying to colleges behind his back, forging his signature. I don't know what I was thinking because I could not afford to pay that, those tuitions. Um, so the struggle to, to be an educated woman and to be informed and uh, to be able to think and think autonomously uh, was a struggle. But it sounds like you also learned from your mom some of her tactics of how to uh, work work the system to <laughs> <laughs> in your own way. So one yeah. of the things that that you wrote um, in your in the chapters about your life in college, and I I will quote a little piece of what you wrote here. You said. I passed as an American, but that was just an outer garment, a chador. In truth, I was a traditional Mashadi Jewish girl, like it or not. And then in a little bit later, you, you refer to yourself as a hybrid through and through, a Yankee with a Bukharian shepherd co costume tucked in my closet. So when did that change for you? Or is it still true in some ways? How do you think about your, um, your kind of hybrid or inner and outer identities now? Well, that's a good question. You know, I always feel like an outsider. Uh, if I'm with Iranians, I don't feel Iranian. Uh, I was born here, bred here, went to school here. My friends are Americans and I feel like an outsider. If I'm with um, Americans, I also feel like an outsider. You know, it's like that Iranian mashadi part of me starts to surface and so wherever I am, I don't really feel a part of, but it has worked for me and it has worked in my best interest. I think, I think it's wonderful to be an outsider. I think, it, I think you see what other people don't see. You hear what other people are not hearing. Um, I think it feeds into the creative process. I think a lot of people who write and paint who sculpt, uh, who dance, um, who write music, perform, feel like outsiders. And it enables you to um, think independently of how the masses are thinking. So I, I feel it's all been very helpful. It's one of the things as a scholar of women's history, it's one of the things that I often talk about when I teach women's history that we learn so much from people who have been on the margins because they just have different perspectives and hear different kinds of things. So of course that's true in so many different contexts. Yes. Um, and Joan asked the question of whether you felt similarly like an outsider among other Jewish communities. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, growing up, in the 1950s and 60s, it was not cool to be different. And being Mizrahi uh, was certainly not an advantage. Uh, we went to an Ashkenazi, we always went to Ashkenazi shuls. My parents went to Orthodox shuls. And we did not feel treated like equals. It, it, we did feel like we were second class citizens. I, I do not feel that today. Uh, but during my childhood, I certainly did. Um, so I think now, I think now the Ashkenazi world is very interested in others. 
other Jews from other parts of the world and eager to learn and integrate us all. But that wasn't necessarily the case in the 50s and 60s. It was much more of a narrow mindset. Uh, and they felt they were the real deal and we were not. Yeah. Yeah, there's still a lot of work that the American Jewish community needs to do, I think, on that. We're just, we're still early in that process of uh, learning how to, you know, diversify our notion of what, where Jews come from, what our stories are, what, what our culture is. Um, yeah. That's part of what makes your book so important, I think, is that it it adds a different lens on the the Jewish immigrant experience that is a different one from the, you know, traditional Lower East Side, you know, Eastern European immigrant experience. Right. So I want to turn to the role of your mom, who is such a powerful and complex figure in the book. Um, you've already described a little bit of some of her contradictions. She's illiterate, but also very outspoken. She's passionate about fashion. She stands up for your independence in some ways, but she also wants your attention for herself. Um, did your understanding of your mother change over the course of writing the book? What, what was that process like of trying to put your mother on the page? Yeah, I mean, I, as an adult, I felt I was beginning to understand her. I felt um, far more compassionate and I thought I had mastered it. I thought I really had come to terms with her uh, and valued certain aspects, uh, wasn't so comfortable with other parts of her because she was impulsive and um, often would speak without thinking and could be very hurtful in the way she spoke to people in general. And that was, it made me cringe. That was hard for me to watch. However, writing the book took me to a whole nother level. Absolutely. You know, I can think about them and I can talk about them and think I, I now get it. Writing is a whole different process. And I just started to feel deep compassion for her, deep, deep understanding of my father and respect for the way he was and how what I interpreted as a child as being overbearing, an obstacle in my life, uh, primitive in many ways, prehistoric. When I was writing the book, I was feeling he was a giant. He was a giant and a lot of what he did was to protect me from a world he didn't trust and he didn't have any respect for. Um, and he did protect me in lots of different ways. At the time, I didn't feel that, but so writing it, it elevated my understanding of them, of the family, of the culture, because I had to do a lot of research and, and I started to feel it was knitting me together. All these incongruent parts inside of me that were living side by side that felt they were in conflict, no longer felt like they were in conflict as the writing process is an amazing experience. And I started to feel, yes, I am American, I am Iranian, I am Jewish, I am a female. Um, and they're all living side by side. It, there's room for all of this. Uh, and I can have opposing sides inside of me and it's fine. Uh, they all can live. And that was a wonderful feeling that came out of writing. That's amazing. Uh, and I think that that's sort of the dream, I think, of what, a, of what a, the process of writing a memoir is about. And I, I, I imagine in some ways it's not, and maybe I was going to say, it, in some ways I imagine it's not unlike some of the work that you do as, you know, as a therapist. Did you feel like there was a real um, kind of synergy between your professional work? And I mean, I know the writing is a very different kind of 
process, but did you feel like there were ways in which your professional work gave you a, a tool for the memoir writing that the two processes kind of seemed in sync in some way? I think so. I mean, I wasn't fully conscious of it because I wasn't writing like an analyst. Uh, I was writing from the perspective of the little girl and what I was feeling and the teenager and what I was going through and uh, remembering moments, episodes that were so confusing to me at the time and rather humorous, but not making sense out of it. Uh, so I didn't want it to have a clinical tone. I didn't want it to sound like, you know, a psychoanalyst is writing this book. I wanted to get down to um, the seat of my heart and let that speak. Um, but the way I think is always there, you know, my way of listening and my way of thinking. So, of course, you know, it had to enter in uh, in the way I designed the book and the way I told the story. Um, and I think my, my respect for human nature and the ability to succumb and survive, you know, and uh, which is something that I'm always hearing in sessions, you know, how people overcome or battle incredible obstacles. And so my respect uh, was there as I was writing because that's the way I, I think. So it had to be there, yeah. Uh, Paula asks whether you were influenced by other Iranian Jewish writers. No, I can't say that. I mean, I can tell you that whatever I read, whoever I've ever read, has had an impact on me in one way or another. Uh, you know, either I like it, I don't like it, I feel, I feel an affinity, I question it. Um, so writers across the board uh, always make me think and um, but I, I don't think Iranian writers in particular I mean I was uh, I grew up reading Black Beauty, Heidi and the, and the Three Little Peppers and How They Grew and I would read these books over and over again uh, and then later as a teenager I was into Salinger and Henry James and Eugene O'Neill and Pirandello and these were the writers that I thought were brilliant and I just kept reading and reading and um, so it's whatever I can lay my hands on and whatever speaks to me. So one of the questions that I was really thinking about as I was reading the book is that, um, you know, you, the culture that you come from is obviously very restrictive for women, which your mom is certainly very vocal about throughout the story. You, you, you write about how she would make these declarations about how America is good for women. Um, but you also obviously, you know, have a, a great deal of respect for your heritage and where you come from. So how have you grappled with those kinds of oppressive aspects of Persian Jewish culture while continuing to honor your heritage and, and you know, kind of strike that balance of, of what to keep and what to let go of? Oh, I think you have to read the book <laughs> <laughs> because that's what the book is all about, you know? How to, how to move through one's family and how to determine what is useful, what is meaningful, what do I want to not only inhabit, incorporate, but pass on to the next generation and what is either outmoded or hurtful, detrimental in some way to, to a person's development and I just don't want that to be part of my life or my children's. And um, I guess as I'm saying this, speech comes up. You know, I grew up in a home where my father prohibited speech. He said, you are not allowed to talk. And he was very fearful of words and the written word and books. And he felt that they would in some way undermine his authority. And there's some truth to that. I mean, you read books and you think differently from the way your father thinks or your mother thinks. Um, 
And so it was hard because I had to keep a lot to myself and I was not very verbal as a child and I found other outlets. Um, did I want to pass that on to my children? I did the diametric opposite. I really encouraged them to articulate feelings and regardless of what they were and wanted them to learn how to speak in a way in which it's not hurtful to someone else, but in which you're explaining yourself and explaining what you're feeling without having to trash the next person. And so that's an example of where I left that behind, you know, the prohibition of speech uh, and made it, made it very, very significant in my family. Um, and uh, the kids have grown up, they're adults now, they're married, they have children of their own. And I'd like to believe that I had something to do with the fact that they're good communicators and they encourage that within their own families. So that's an example of something I threw out and I reinvented. And Esther asks, and this is a good, I think a good question too, what are some of the traditions that you have held on to or that you've continued to embrace or at least that you, you feel positively about? The first thing that comes to mind is Judaism. Uh, my parents held on tightly as underground Jews. Uh, they came from an ancestry that did that. Uh, they came here and were deep believers. Um, and my father in particular, his love for the Torah and his reading it over and over again privately in his bedroom. He was not a social man. He liked being by himself and he'd tuck himself into bed during the daytime and just have his matzah, his tea and his Torah on his lap. And I think he wasn't demonstrative. He wasn't beating his chest. He was doing it quietly and he was a true believer. Um, I think that commitment to Judaism, I have held on to very strongly and passed on with the help of my husband uh, to the children. And um, I, I think that's primary. And what is your children's relationship to their Persian heritage? Boy, that's something you'd have to ask them. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> I wonder sometimes. I mean, they are fascinated by the stories. They know some Persian words, which they love to um, suddenly <laughs> say at a time when they think no one else will understand and they'll throw out a Persian word. Um, they love Persian food and insist that I prepare certain meals when they come over. Um, but exactly the tie that they feel, I, I feel my book has strengthened their tie. Uh, they read the book, they loved it. They want their children to read it. And I think it has helped them feel more of an allegiance to the past that they never knew. One of the things that I found fascinating in your book is the role that your brothers play as yes. sort of protectors and guides and translators and, um, you know, as, as in some ways stepping in when your parents weren't able to kind of help you with the things that you wanted to pursue. Um, tell us a little bit about their, their role and, and, how they influenced your journey? Well, both of them were heroic, heroic brothers. Uh, one is 10 years older than me and the other is seven years older. Um, and they grew up very fast. They were very mature for their age. So they really, they really stood me on their shoulders. They wanted me to see the world through their eyes, be exposed. Uh, I 
have so many fond memories. Albert the eldest was the person who took me bra shopping when I was becoming an adolescent and he was aware that I needed to wear a bra. My mother was oblivious and in, in a very kind and respectful way, he, he said, you know, maybe we should just go together to a department store called Alexander's on Queens Boulevard in Queens and just see if we could get you some bras. I said, okay. So we held hands and we went into Alexander's and he found a shopkeeper to uh, help me out in the dressing room. And we, he bought me five bras and he was 20, 21, 22 at that time. I was 11, 12. Um, and it was, it was such a kind gesture. He was a maternal figure in some ways. So David would take me to MoMA, to museums. When I was eight, nine, 10 years old, uh, we'd go on the subway together and he wanted to introduce me to art. And again, he was seven years older. Uh, he would be reading literature to me secretly in the bedroom so my father wouldn't hear. And uh, we would be discussing the meaning of the words and the concepts. Uh, so they were my mentors. They were parents, mentors, friends. Uh, and I'm eternally indebted to them. But it sounds like they also stayed very much within the community that you were raised in. Yeah. More so maybe than, than you did as the younger, more fully American of the children. Yes. It's always interesting in immigrant families how the, you know, how those, the generations within siblings can even make such a big difference. Right. Um, I was curious sort of how, you know, I know I asked at the beginning sort of how someone who was, did not come from a, a tradition of literacy became a writer. I'm also curious how you became a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, because it seems like that also is a very different um, approach than, you know, probably what was usual within your, your community, not only in terms of having a profession, but particularly psychoanalysis. Well, I think I was always uh, a watcher and a listener and uh, being a quiet child and trying very much to be invisible because that's what was expected by my father. Um, I listened closely and I was always trying to make sense of what was going on around me. So that was always, always inside. Uh, I don't think it's such a surprise. I'm fascinated by people and have always been intrigued, curious, uh, not satisfied with answers. And, um, and then when I was in college, I was an art history major and that's not so different. You know, you're looking at inanimate objects that are not speaking and you are explaining you are writing in art history. I, I wrote so many papers about paintings and sculptures and you know, what is really being said? Why is this significant? Um, very often there's, there's psychological insight in art and trying to understand it, uncover it, put it into uh, accessible language. Um, so turning silence into speech. Uh, so then becoming an analytic psychotherapist is the same. You know, you watch body language, you listen to tone of voice, you listen to what's said and what's not being said. Um, it's all tied in. Uh, so actually having achieved education and being able to establish a career that was, that was quite a challenge coming from the family I came from. But the fact that that was my leaning is not so unusual. Makes sense. 
Uh, we have so many writers in our community and uh, I, people always love to hear about the writing process. So can you share with us a little bit about what, what the process was to, to bird this, this book? Yes, yes. In fact, I, I'm just right now, I'm writing a piece about process. Um, it was very, very difficult for me to, to write this, not because I didn't have the language, not because I didn't have the memories, I was battling that part of me that was censoring me, that was saying, how dare you? You know, for generations, people from the Mashadi community have not written their story. They haven't first person, you know, made themselves transparent, talked about what it felt like to be an underground Jew uh, in Iran. And they just haven't done it for various reasons, but they haven't done it. And so it was almost as if the city of Mashhad, the Milaz, the Imams who prohibit free speech and uh, freedom, somehow they were in my psyche prohibiting me, even though here I am, Jewish American raised in this country. And that voice of Mashhad was inside of me saying, how dare you? Uh, you're gonna be punished. You know, you'll be in some way incarcerated. Um, so I had to battle that. And uh, I had to tell myself, I had, I had all these different tricks. I tell myself, I'm writing this for me. I'm not gonna share it with the world, okay? So basically that voice leave me alone because I'm not making this public. And then I was okay. Then I would be writing and writing and writing and rewriting and editing and rewriting, um, telling myself, it, it's a con job. I had to con myself into, no one's gonna read this. This is just for me. And that was very helpful because I was able to complete the piece and a publishing house loved it and picked it up. And of course there's an editor in the publishing house and. She was marvelous and she went over it with me. And, uh, and by that time, I felt strong enough to like let it go, let it go into the world. Um, but there's a lot of, in my case, there was a lot of self-censorship that felt it was coming from a world that I never lived in, a city I never grew up in. And yet it was in my head. It's amazing how powerful culture is, even when you've only uh, received it, you know, by transmission from your parents, even if you haven't experienced it firsthand. Yeah. I, so I know that you did a lot of research as you were, you know, kind of filling in the parts of the story that were from before you were born or before you had memories. W were there any particular surprises that you learned about? Any particular stories that, you know, you hadn't heard until you were working on the book that were just really amazing to learn about? Yes. Um, I learned that in the 1940s, when my parents were living in Iran, my father would have to, this is living, when he was in the city of Mashhad, my father would have to, if he was in a store and he wanted to buy something, he would have to put his change in a cup filled with water, put his money in that cup. In other words, his, his, his coins were being washed because they came from the hands of a Jew. And then the storekeeper would take the coins out of that cup. And that was the way a transaction was made, that Jews had to put their money in some kind of a basin, like a wash basin, uh, when they were buying something, as if they carried a disease, as if they were um, infectious in some way. Uh, and that was very interesting to me. That was very interesting. You know, my father hinted at it once, and I didn't know if that was true. And then I did research and I found out that was the law of the land. This is what was going on in the provinces. And, um, 
And then my brother, who is much older than I am, told me he remembered exactly seeing my father do that. Uh, and I thought how horrifying and how dehumanizing. Um, but yes, that, that would be an example. Hmm. That is quite, it's quite a, a powerful image. Um, and how did that, I, one of the things that I was curious about with that piece of the story is, you know, how, I know that your family was sort of hidden in their Jewishness, but also obviously people must have known they were Jews if they were subject to those kinds of um, restrictions or, or rules. So how did that work, that kind of hidden versus, yeah. you know, It's, it's complicated, it's identity. complicated. Because on the one hand, the Jews of Mashhad pretended they were Muslim. My mother wore the black chador, she looked, which is that black cloak. She looked through eye slits. Uh, my father prayed in public squares five times a day. He knew the Quran like the back of his hand. Um, and yet the Muslims of Mashhad knew who the Jews were. Uh, the Jews lived in a ghetto and every so often there would be riots. Uh, they would break into the Jewish ghetto. They would rape, plunder, kill. Um, so it was a charade. There was a charade taking place. And my father's role at that time was to grease the palms of the millahs. And every few months he would collect money from the community and go and give it to the millah. And the understanding was look the other way, like leave us alone for a few months. Uh, and they were being bribed to look the other way, not that they looked the other way for very long. Um, so you're right, there was, there was this charade that was taking place. Can we uh, expect other books from you in the future? Is there more writing for you yet to do? Absolutely. There are many more stories and uh, I hope to, to work on a number of short stories and put them together that way. Um, but I do have more, yeah. That's wonderful. Um, it's great to hear that. I know that this, one of the things that I think is so powerful about your book is that it's both very specific about you know, a community that not very many people know about. And it also, I think, and I'm sure you've gotten this response from many people, will resonate with so many people who have had the experience of, you know, straddling cultures or being an immigrant or, uh, you know, fighting some of the assumptions of their family. So there's so much universal wisdom and lessons there as well. Absolutely. You know, a, a friend read the book and she turned to me and she said, Esther, this is not a Persian story. This is not a Jewish story. This is an American story. And I looked at her and I had to stop and think. And I said, you're right, because I've been getting emails from men and women from around the world with different backgrounds. They're not Jewish. They're not uh, Persian. And they're saying, your story speaks to me. I'm thinking, what? Who, who ever had a father like mine? Whoever had a mother like mine, um, and yet that, I guess there are just, you know, core elements, a skeletal structure, being the outsider, uh, coming from parents who held on to their past, their culture, their country, uh, children, first generation children trying to find their way. Uh, so, it is, you know, the more specific, I got very specific in this book and I discovered the more idiosyncratic, the more specific your story, the more universal. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Esther, for being with us tonight and for sharing your story with us. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us and for your excellent questions. I hope you will all read Esther's book if you haven't already. Uh, and I also hope that you will join us next week um, when we will be in conversation with uh, Laura Littman uh, about her new book, My Life as a Villainess. Um, it should be a great conversation as well. 
Um, and I hope that you will also check out the many, many resources that we have in our digital archive at jwa.org uh, from online exhibits to lesson plans, to primary sources, to our podcast, our multi-generational blog. We have so much material to discover and help you gain insight about the diversity of the Jewish story. Uh, one of our latest podcast episodes, which just came out last week, is about the suffrage centennial and the fight for women's rights, which, as we know, looks different in lots of different places. So we explored the, the anniversary that we're just celebrating. Um, so I hope that people will check that out. Thank you again, Esther, for being with thank us. You. And everybody, thank you. Be well. And we look forward to seeing you next week.